Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my buddy Paul Barron and today we are bringing you a very special guest. He has a very interesting background. He grew up in Rockford, Illinois playing in a in a junior drum and bugle corps and uh, I remember the I, I, I come from a drum corps background too and I remember the Phantom Regiment back in those days. Uh -huh. uh, in in college uh, you you were playing big band jazz and you were having you know, a little bit of issues which we can maybe talk about later on and then you went on a ro on the road with a with a circus and uh, that's a whole other story but uh, the circuses have ruined many many a fine <laughs> trumpet player over the years as have cruise ships and uh, other kinds of gigs uh, and you studied over at Georgia State University and began to study with uh, more symphony players, primarily the principal at that time, John Head, who was your teacher and mentor. And then you've had a distinguished and a very busy freelance career uh, playing in Atlanta in 80 through 87, uh, as well as, uh, you know, with visiting acts and all the all the cool things that we do as trumpet players. And you were an extra with the uh, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And also you had uh, auditioned and been appointed principal trumpet of the New Mexico Symphony Orchestra uh, in Albuquerque between 87 and 92. And then you had some other studies, uh, I guess, during those years with some, some big names in the trumpet world, uh, Vincent Chickowitz, uh, Bud Herseth, uh, Jacobs, Clevenger. And in 92, you won the second trumpet utility position with the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Orchestra. And then you moved over to third, I guess, upon the retirement of James Pandolfi. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you recently retired from the Met. So, um, you know, and I guess the other thing I need to tell everybody is you have a fantastic uh, new book out that I've been enthralled with reading. I couldn't put it down, which is called The Singing Trumpet, published by Carl. Carl Fisher. So welcome, Peter Bond. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I've enjoyed your interviews with other players. Thank, Thank you. you. Peter. Well, I'm going to throw out the first question. Um, and reading your book, the, the very first thing that uh, that struck me was when you started talking about the mask. And uh, that was a concept that uh, was presented to me by uh, an old mentor uh, hmm. way back in about 1978, a trombone player. Um, they played a lot of classical stuff. He, uh, he was the principal of the Vancouver Opera Orchestra um, as well. He played with Harry James and on and on. But he, he said, think of the mask, think of them. But he didn't tell me anything more than that. <laughs> so for the next 20 years, I was <laughs> going, OK, well, he says the yeah. mask. There's got to be something yeah. to that. And then I read it in your book. So can we start off? Can, can you explain to the rest of us, <laughs> me included, what? exactly well, that means as best i can um well so uh, i think there, there are two schools of of singing there are opera leader uh choral singers what we call trained singers and they use maximize the resonance of their body prime you know principally the head voice and they they talk about projecting through the mask and that would be the sinuses and they feel like they're projecting in this way and it's a way of uh maximizing resonance for projection and then all the other singers, pop, rock and roll, Broadway, etc., use a less resonant technique, a little more in chest voice. It's more compressive, less resonant, not less expressive, but less resonant. And so, um, and, um, uh, you know, and if you've ever heard an opera singer sing a pop song, it's kind of like, that's no, you know, and, and likewise, a few pop singers are We'll, we'll try to sing opera because it's so different, it's so weird, you know, but we have to, as trumpet players, we have to cross over idioms all the time. And so um, um, I'm thinking, you know, uh, in the mask and maximum resonance playing, um, you know, uh, vocal transcriptions or orchestra music or solo literature, whereas in a commercial, uh, you know, uh, uh, commercial setting I haven't done commercial music in, in many years um, it's it's more parallel with those kind of singers so you know a little bit more compressive a little bit less resonant in the body not less expressive but it's a different thing and, and you know we've all heard you know uh, you know a, a symphony player steps you're a, a 
conservatory guy steps into the big band and it just doesn't work. The style issues aside, you know, it's just like the sound is wrong and vice versa. You, you get a lead player and you put him in the orchestra and it's kind of like, eh, it doesn't quite work. But I think we can use these parallels to, um, uh, excuse me, these vocal techniques to kind of be the right guy and kind of change personalities the way an actor would. So, yeah, I'm, when I'm playing, I'm thinking of projecting in this way as opposed to pushing air pushing sound through the horn and i want to i think of the um, i'm resonating here here and i want the uh, i treat the trumpet as an extension of my body rather that rather than an instrument that i blow into um so that, that's my uh, that's my thinking there and i've just moved the engine from here the vocal cords to there but i'm all the other things are as, as much the same as I can make them, the resonance in the mouth and, and, uh, and articulation and uh, placing high, you know, thinking for us trumpet players, thinking in falsetto, deep, set, you know, raises the soft palate, very conducive for playing the trumpet. Trombone players, that's in their vocal range, at least for the men. So they've got it made. We're way up high. So um, uh, those, those parallels have been very helpful for me. And, and articulating uh, like, exactly like I speak, I'm from Northwest of Chicago is basically anchor tonguing. I didn't know it at the time, but I always said that, and I could always do these freakish things like lip drills and flexibilities. And then somebody at once said, "Hey, you did that anchor tonguing thing," and I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, "I didn't know what it was, but it was just the way I speak." I tell, I call for my students, I call it the Chicago speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have some I, really great sayings in there. Um, I, I can't remember. There was a three-word one that uh, had tuba in it. Um, and, and I said that over and over, at, uh, just feeling where my tongue was when I said that. And by God, it was exactly as you described. I never yeah. knew that I did an anchor tongue. I had no idea. And yeah, when I tried I think, to do it yeah. on trumpet, I failed. Yeah, but anchor tongue is a horrible name. I mean, it sounds like some kind of dental procedure. You know, it's just awful. I think Herbert Clark coined it, but I think it's the way most people speak North American English, you know, and, and we're all a little bit different. So, you know, I think anchor tongue, you know, has a, there's a range of, you know, some, some people do more forward, some backwards. I have a very large tongue, not everybody does. And, and so I think a good rule of thumb is if you articulate pretty close to the way you speak, you can have your maximum expression and fluidity and, and speed and all those other things that we need. But uh, the more it's like anger tonguing, you know, that arch in the front of the mouth, you know, serves an acoustical purpose in, um, in the, uh, I'll say classical music and a compressive, um, uh, you, know, per, you know, velocity for guys who did that high velocity commercial playing. And fortunately it's the same thing. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of a win-win. Well, I think it's really cool. Um, I mean, I have to tell everybody the title of the book is The Singing Trumpet, but it's the subtitle here is what really intrigued me. And it's, it's, it says using singing and speech as literal models for trumpet performance. Uh, and I think that's great. So why don't you just continue a little bit and why don't you explain singing and speech there uh, as it relates in these parallel worlds like again like you're talking about the pop and the opera as opposed to commercial and classical trumpet playing i think it's really interesting okay i i tell my students or so anyone who comes to a lesson from for uh the first thing i do is this is an exercise that's in the book i'll have them place their hand on their sternum take a normal breath on their breastbone have them take a normal breath and blow a windstream like they're blowing out a candle and I'll say, beautiful. Now, place your hand here again, take the same breath, and sing a note. Ah, uh, ah, uh, octave of your choice, right? And sing some note. Then I'll have them blow the candles out again. And I'll say, do you notice anything happening differently beneath your hand? And they'll, you know, and I'll get various answers. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. And I'll say, you know, I can see it. Your chest collapses when you blow, and it stays elevated when you sing. And singers call that keeping the chest open. And my students call it superhero posture or opera star posture, you know, because they feel very, I love you, I hate you, I kill you, you know, that opera star <laughs> thing, right? But, you know, and if, we, if you see Maurice Andre and, and any number of famous, you know, players, they're playing like that and the relationship of their head, et cetera. But anyway, um, so I'll ask them, all right, so you're singing the note, and we'll do a falsetto note if it's a trumpet player. Deep. I'll say, how much air are you using? Oh, 
Uh, not much. Yeah, not much at all. You know, and even if you yell, I, I'll say, are you blowing your voice? No. Okay. Well, why don't we try to do the same thing on the trumpet? Okay, so instead of blowing the sound through the horn, which is which was impossible anyway, it's a it's a you know a physical impossibility. It's an illusion. So instead of going, oh, I lost my train of thought a little bit. So I said, all right. So the chest collapses. I beg your pardon. So um, all right. So the the point is the body uses the air differently to sing than it does to blow. And we're taught to blow, and the kids does. Of course, you idiot. It's a wind instrument. But I'll say, okay. Why don't we use a singing technique and set it? Ah, uh, and this was driven home to me. Uh, we, uh, at the opera, we have these rehearsals called Zitz Probes, which is a, a rehearsal with just the orchestra and the principal singers and the conductor. And you work out, you know, tempi and blah, interpretation, et cetera. And so these singers would be sitting right behind me and I'd be watching them. And, and any number of them can bury a hundred pieces orchestra with no microphone. And you know, it's sounding fantastic. And they're not doing any of the histrionic breathing that I was taught. They're not turning red in the face. And I thought, can I do what they do? And, you know, because I'm holding my trumpet feeling like a fool, you know, because they're just, ah, and just, it's like crazy. And lo and behold, it works. So I'm thinking about using my, using my wind. Ah, and if anything, I lift up from the center of my body, which oddly enough kind of coincides with some of the yoga things that you hear from heard from Maynard Ferguson, people like that. It's just not as extreme. So I think it's all a kind of a continuum. So I'm thinking of, I think of my, my torso as a cylinder. Want to take a breath? <sighs> Everything gets bigger from the center. And I just imagine there's a piston in the middle and it just comes up gently. Ah, like I would sing happy birthday to you or whatever. And, um, and the, and for this to work really well, the chops have to be fairly optimal. Um, but then I can use, um, and I just think of making the sound um, pretty much in my head or in my mouth. Um, and I think it was, uh, I was uh, very happy to see, uh, it was at Lewis Dowdswell that you guys interviewed. Yes. The English, tremendous English player. And, and he was saying much the same thing, although he lives in a completely different world. So, so if you're anchor tonguing, ta, 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 I think of it, uh, I think of the tongue is forward. And the roof of the mouth is here and the teeth are there. And I call that area the Bermuda Triangle. And I try to make, I try to control everything from the Bermuda Triangle within reason. And so, and I can pressurize that, relax my chops, and I can get a very fiery sound or I can get a very, you know, uh, uh, mellow sound. And it's, uh, I just, you know, so I, I'm thinking of singing and using my air like a singer until you get to, um, you know, above high C, then you sort of have to go into turbo because the, the, the um uh the uh, physics of the instrument change you know now I it's think, a little more of a megaphone i think one of the things that you were alluding to it a while ago you know i mean this anchor tongue is about it's i've never really cared for it as well yeah but it leads a lot of people to believe the tip of their tongue is down in a certain place and everything is tongued with the tongue in that position yeah and the fact is at least when i do it because i do both i go actually between the two but i it raises, you know, where your tip is, it, it floats back there, I, depending on what term. register, what register you're in. So it's that's not a, really anchored. Yeah, I, I've done moving x-rays. I've done moving x-ray uh, things playing and uh, I can, act, well, not, I, not to um, necessarily, I have a very large tongue, but you're right. I, I, I think of the tongue as just kind of floating or rubbing or hanging out. It just winds up there. How many places can it be if you're, if you're articulating a little further back? But I, I was able to articulate that, 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 uh, from, you know, uh, low C, G, middle C, high C. And uh, my tongue remained exactly the same. But the rest of my tongue, you can almost, you can see it go boop, 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 boop. And, yeah. I, uh, and that was the source of one of the pictures in my book. I just copied my own um, x-ray. But, you know, but, I, but one of the dangers is, you know, people say tongue level and raise your tongue to go high and stuff. You know, if, uh, if you do it in the back, if you go like that, that's trouble. And, and uh, I speak from painful firsthand experience about that. Cause that, and that's where you get your, your blackouts and you know, you, you're, it's like choking a hose and mm -hmm. you just, you know, you, you bring up the pressure and you've got those crazy headaches and 
Oh, it's awful. Um, so I mean, you want that all of resistant the action and action in the front of your mouth and everything in the back just stays wide open and there's no problem. It, it so, seems um, like there's always been a misconception, or at least I had, um, with the anchor tongue, not not to re regress net necessarily, but where where I thought anchor, I mean, that's that's firm, right? You know, Yeah, like, literal. You, you like throw you an anchor down teeth. from a boat, you don't want that boat to move. So I'm, exactly. I was pushing against my back teeth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's an unfortunate name. Yeah, it is. So I, I, I just try to, I say, tongue like you talk. So I'll have a diagnostic or I'll have a, I don't have a trumpet with me right now, but the kid goes, I'll say, play some tongue, some G's for me, at, you know, and, uh, or some easy note and pull the horn off your face and keep tonguing and blowing. Ta, 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 ta. And, and I'll say, is that the way you talk? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Frequently it's and, or some variation thereof. And they said, okay, that's not necessarily wrong or anything, but let's try it the way you speak and see what happens. So ta, ta, ta. And then I'll have them put their lips around the outside of the mouthpiece like they're blowing water and you'll get that characteristic slapping sound that everybody everywhere knows. And I said, okay, now sneak your chaps in the mouthpiece. You're not going to blow nearly that hard, but just ta, ta, ta. And it has the vertical sensation. And some guys call it flat tonguing because ta, ta it has that vertical feel, feels sloppy. And I use those, I use those, um, kind of provocative words. I use blatty, sloppy to try to get them, you know, into a new zone, fat tonguing, or some people call it flat tonguing. Some people call it fat tonguing because your tongue feels fat in the front of your mouth. And they were, they were told always keep the airway open and make your mouth as big as possible. And I say, yeah, we'll try this different thing and see what happens. Or then basically it's, it's kind of the way they talk, ta, ta, ta. And we're not going to use any more air than you would say, ta, ta, ta. And so we're going to project sound, not necessarily wind. And I try to get the, the chops to explode, you know, and really fire the trumpet and get, a, I want to get as much sound as I can with as little physical effort. And a lot of times that kind of opens the door to, oh, I don't have to blow my head off to play forte. You know, I can just think of the chops stay relaxed and I can think of, I'll pressurize a little bit in my mouth if I want to think of it that way, or I think of changing my voice from this to that, you know, uh, so you can have that same kind of subtle thing, create these different kinds of sounds. Um, but, you know, for kind of extreme playing or what I call scorched earth trumpet, you know, I can open my mouth, I can bring my tongue forward, I pressurize that area, and I can play incredibly loud without blowing my head off or tearing up my face. And Well, uh, we were talking and we just finished a video on and shared it with everybody, Paul and I, uh, about projection. And, and this is exactly uh -huh. what we were talking about in there, cool. that you don't have to kill yourself. I mean, you, we, we want to play as efficiently as we can, and we want to let the horn be as resonant as possible, you know? Right. One of the things that I, I love, Peter, is that you talked about um, only thinking of projecting the, the sound, what, three inches or so into the lead pipe and let the horn yeah, if, take yeah, if the rest that. of it from there, if that. Yeah. yeah. If Well, so, and, and again, for, for what I do, um, you know, for orchestral music, you certainly want a range of colors. But if I think of everything happening behind the mouthpiece, in my head, in my chest, ah, me, ah whatever i've got control over it and i want this resonating system to control the other resonating system which is the instrument this is endlessly variable and flexible the trumpet is plumbing yeah sophisticated plumbing but plumbing right so it's fixed and so i want to control it. i want to use this to control that and um and so it's to the degree i think inside my mouth and back in my um uh in my head and stuff i get a pretty bright sound well, so let's say I play Brahms. I want a chorale. I want, you know, I, that's going to be the wrong tone. That, at that point, I'll think about three inches or four inches down the lead pipe, and I will blow a little bit, knowing that blowing, blowing the chops will attenuate the high harmonics. Sorry, I got a tractor going by behind me. We, we can't hear it. It's fine. Campus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so if you blow, the chops go slightly dead. It, it takes the high harmonics out and you can use that as an expressive tool to, you know, you can shave those high harmonics and get, even without playing the, uh, uh, changing equipment, I can get a warm, rich sound. Or if I think back here and pressurize, I can get a very bright, noisy sound. So if I can play a, a chorale, a fanfare, or make expressive changes within a, a sonata or a concerto or you know, whatever, if that made sense. 
It, Sorry. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great thing. I mean, yes, our equipment changes high compression, low compression. It changes uh, the type of sound that we have, that it emphasizes the highs or it emphasizes the mids or the lows. But ultimately, at least to a certain degree, we're all, ha we all, you know, I mean, I personally, I wouldn't want to go try to play lead trumpet on a, on a one and a quarter C or something like that. Oh, right? it's fun. You should try it. <laughs> <laughs> I have. It's not, <laughs> not for me. I'm not that strong. <laughs> you know, neither I, am I. <laughs> um, but, but we are able to change, you know, I've noticed that a lot, you know, just by the way we, we open up and I have never thought of it though, as much as you have in this, I think one of the really cool things that you talk about in here that you use is some of the words you use and the imagery that you project into people's minds, which really helps, um, it, it helps make the point, you know, and so I've, I've yeah. found it very unique in the way you do it. I think I really like the book a lot. I, I Thank you. I've, I'm a kind of a visually oriented person anyway, uh, but I, I also try to find as many words as I can. You know, we are, you know, are, are, we want to have a big toolbox of, of, of uh, things that we can use with students, you know. Try this, try that. That doesn't work. Okay, think of it this way. Blah blah. And there's you know, and there's no rules really. The only rule there is is blowing the phone. You know, beyond that, because as soon as you make a rule, somebody's gonna don't puff out your cheeks. Well, what about that Dizzy Gillespie? Thing? <laughs> I know. Or you know, name your guy, right? Right. Uh, I know. There's but, always somebody. So, so I think if you have, we have some like um, general you know kind of rules of some like for a student, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to articulate like I speak and I want it to resonate here and maybe I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try to do the least and get the most you can hardly really go wrong and you'll find your kind of own way you know we're all physically a little bit different and I'm always asking students if they make a good sound or something I say um, well how would you what were you doing what, what was your perception of what you're doing and sometimes they come up with things I never would have thought of one student played a fabulous uh, crescendo and their tone was terrific. And I said, wow, that was exactly what we want. That was amazing. What were you thinking of? And they said, it felt like I had a little ball of energy in my mouth that just got bigger and bigger. And I thought, I'm stealing that. That was yeah. great. It's it's just terrific. And of course the audience just, they hear sound, right? And so it's, you know, so it's an illusion. It sounds like, you know, you're blowing for the exit signs or the marching band kids are blowing for the press box or or whatever. Then it sounds like you're blowing your head off. But no, the people who can really play, you know, they're not doing that. Otherwise, they wouldn't last to the end of the show, you know. Uh, well, so I think the other thing, too, that's really cool about this, you know, uh, I read a, I read a thing some a couple of years back where I think it was uh, Malcolm McNabb. And he was saying, I play more efficiently now than I have ever played, you know. And I think as we get older, we need to learn to do that, not only from the standpoint of being more musical, but also from the standpoint of like, I'm not 20 anymore, so I, I know I don't have the air capacity that I had, but rather than to waste all this wind that I have to, to let it, you know, work properly, it allows me to play, you know, phrases that maybe I otherwise might not be able to do. Sure, you've learned, to, you know, you, maybe you don't need all that wind that you use when you're 20 and you're going, you know, there's another way to do this and I can work, you know, it can be a lot easier. And, I think know, the trumpet is loud anyways, you know, and with the wind thing, it just becomes so loud. I mean, and there's times when we need that, but overall, it's a pretty darn loud instrument, right? <laughs> I, I never think of wind or air when I play and that freaks people out. I only think of vibrating and, and, and uh, sometimes a little bit of pressurization when I want to like really get a fiery sound. Other than that, I never think about it. I just think about vibrating and the correct amount of wind uh, follows. Just like you never think about, no one goes, ah, hello, right? When you answer the phone, you don't do that, right? Or, you, you know, you take a breath, okay. And I, I think um, I'm, I'll go out on limb. I'm, I'm not a big fan of this, these breathing exercises and breathing gym stuff. And that, you know, I, I think it leads people down kind of a, it's got to be right for some people, but it leads a lot of kids down to down kind of the wrong path that they, they worry about wind and not, don't worry about sound and music and all the reason they're doing it in the first place.
Well, something you had in your book that I, I thought was uh, really cool is um, to, to practice in front of a mirror. And unlike what I did when I was practicing in front of a mirror when I was much younger, is I was trying to have the perfect looking embouchure. It was completely aesthetics. It wasn't anything else. But as a... Yeah, you a and me both. <laughs> <laughs> but as a diagnostic tool, you know, what you were talking about is just looking at the amount of effort that or or the appearance of all of this extra wasted effort. And, you know, I, I it, it makes me think about Maynard Ferguson. We all, we've seen Maynard play live and, and that huge breath and all the rest of that stuff. But, but, you know, as we've gotten older and know people that played with Maynard and, and uh, heard stories that Maynard said, well, yeah, you got to look like you're working really hard yeah. because that'll sell tickets. But really, yeah. you know, uh, he was so efficient with that. And, and yeah. uh, I, I think your point about playing in front of a mirror and don't make it look hard, because if you're looking like it's a hard, uh, you know, effort that you're putting into it, it probably is. Yeah, that was from Arnold Jacobs. He said, you want to project a sense of ease, both orally and visually, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You, let's make it look easy. By God, it becomes easy, you know? And the, the point about Maynard is great because, you know, he was, he knew he was in show business. He said as much, you know, he knew what he was doing, you know, how else could he have such an incredible career? Yeah. One of a kind, that's for sure. Um, I was going to ask you here, there's so many things and I know we have just a limited amount of time here. You got so many cool exercises in this book and you, you explore all the, the various ranges of dynamics and colors and you talk about things. Um, let's talk a little bit more just uh, from your standpoint about um, becoming stronger and about, you know, as, as we age, you know, it, 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 the trumpet's a bit of a bear to play even when you're playing it <laughs> correctly. So what kinds of things do you personally do to stay in shape and to move things, keep things moving forward? Um, okay. Um, I, I guess the, maybe all, the, the one thing that all kind of trumpet players would agree on, I would hope, is you want to have that, I call it the diamond, right? You know, and it's like, it's like a tent. It's like, a you know, you go, the camping tent has, it's made of flexible material, but you have a rigid structure that supports it. You know, so you've got the aluminum poles and, and or wooden poles, but the material of the tent remains flexible and pliable and soft or whatever. And I think that's, you know, if you talk to most teachers and players, it says, yeah, you want to have those corners and that's kind of our, that's going to, you know, save us, you know, and, and allow us not to abuse that bit. Um, and, and so any kind of, and I don't think you have to do um, necessarily really hard super loud playing but you could you know for for isometric purposes but you could just play easy exercises but breathe for your nose and you, you know just hold that you know whether it's the um you know the the infamous um uh uh cat anderson you know whisper whisper g yeah yeah and you know i read uh, jeff winstead's book you know i got and before he talks about how to do it it was kind of like it, it, i was playing in a, a brass band once the e-flat corner player was dodgy right the high guy and then all of a sudden he started like sounding a lot better i thought well, i gotta find out what this guy's doing and he said i'm doing this kate anderson thing that i read you know i i thought okay i'm gonna try this and so i did it according to the instructions and, and by gum my high register started getting better and i went well now why does this work and the idea you know and as you guys probably well know you're supposed to play it with your teeth touching right and you play very, very, very soft, and you play it for a long time, you breathe through your nose, okay? What's it do? Your teeth are touching, you can't roll your chops over your teeth. You can't, you can't overlap your chops, which is what so many guys do. And you have to create what's probably your ideal embouchure, right? And then you play super soft, and you can't possibly hurt yourself. So like the worst thing that can happen is you wasted 20 minutes of your life. But it does kind of, you know, it does kind of train this. And I, I think it's an ingenious study. And I think a lot of teachers have talked about similar kind of things. So a little bit of that playing, and I try to get, I try to use color, meaning for, for uh, in order to project and, uh, over decibels, you know. Um, so um, I find, I don't, 
the older I get, the more efficient I get. And the playing the trumpet is not very difficult or not, excuse me, that's, that was a terrible thing to say. It's not very physically demanding until we get into the extremities of, of, of volume and, you know, and really high register. But even so, you know, for a young player, you want to, uh, or if I have to play something very high, I will um, use soft studies to get up there, get the control, you know, it's kind of like the, the difference between, the, you know, a cabinet maker and a, and, a, and a lumberjack. They both work with wood, but, you know, that's where the, you know, <laughs> the similarities he stops. And I don't want to, I used to play the trumpet like a lumberjack, you know, chopping down a tree. And now I want to do it with, you know, some kind of precision. And you get a, you know, you get a piece of that high, whatever it is. And, and then I bring it down and I try to tie the registers together. And it's all about getting a certain amount of um, uh, 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 fluency and control, you know, and stuff. Uh, and I, and I too I do try not to think in in stereotypic trumpet terms in the way I was, you know, brought up. Whereas, you know, it's like weightlifting and yeah. and like that. Sure, sure. There's 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 physical component. There's there's um, conditioning. There's a little bit of that, of course. But I always try to keep the the sound uh, uh, good, as good as I possibly can. I don't want to make poor sounds in, in hoping to sound better later. So, and I use sound as a diagnostic, right? So if you, uh, I, if I had a trumpet here, I'd do a demo, but you hear a guy with a miserable tone, you know, it's not gonna get much better later, you know? Uh, uh, so you start with this, the tone is a, is a window into the function of, and how it's working. You hear somebody with a clear, beautiful sound, you go, he's doing it right, this is gonna be okay, you know? Well, I know we're just about out of time. I have one last question I would like to ask you, just because so many people have done this. I could talk to you all day long here, and hopefully we will do that sometime over a beer, because this It'd is be lovely. really fascinating. <laughs> but we have all had this, whether you're uh, Doc Severinsen or me or Paul or everybody in our group, you're not normal if you haven't experienced uh, beating your chops up and, and, and potentially playing in a dysfunctional manner. So I'm curious as to, you know, my getting out of dysfunction was brought about through Jimmy Stamp, pointing uh -huh. out a few things that I had done incorrectly. And then for the rest of my life, uh, you know, it's constantly keeping these things in check for me. I know what makes me tick, but I'm curious for when, as to w when you have a student that comes in that just is not playing properly, dysfunctional, can't play high, tone's not great, not f no fluidity. What do you do to get them out of that? Uh, one of the first things that I do, uh, if, if a young player comes to me and they have that really ghastly, constipated, sound something like that particularly young players you know uh is you know i'll say you know you remember when you were in beginning band and you, you you know you picked up the trombone and the tuba and you played those farty blatty low notes i want you to do that now on the trumpet and so you give them permission to sound really obnoxious and terrible and what you're after of course is freedom and i say i want a really blatty tone you know and, you know they're well, maybe open your jaw a little bit. Oh, more sound comes up. Let your chops flap in the breeze, right? And then they'll suddenly get the sound that makes the, you know, it's like the horn's going to fall apart in your hands. And we've all, you know, gotten that, you know, kind of over the top sound. And I'll say, that's perfect function. Kid will say, oh, I'll get kicked out of band if I play like that. I say, yes, you will. You're just <laughs> blowing too hard. And we'll take that really, uh, red, you know, the, the blattiness is just all the harmonic activity and they're just blowing too hard. So we're going to take that and we put a decrescendo on it. But we want to keep all that harmonic activity, all that, all that zzz, the, what the trombone players call the rattle or the burn or whatever. I want all that harmonic activity. And they can generally wind it down to about nothing. And I said, see, we can make that a very humane, you know, kind of thing. And then I'll talk about, um, you know, we'll establish that. And they say, well, okay, I got a great, I got a great low C. How do I play other notes? I say, well, we're not going to go up to them. We're going to go forward into them because there's no such thing as high notes and low notes. There's fast vibrations and slow vibrations. And I get them to maybe think on a more of a horizontal basis, which is a little more in, in sync with um, uh, 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 the idea of, uh, you know, melody and, and forward motion. Uh, and, it, you know, th that's one tool I can use. The biggest problem I see is, you know, the chops are overlapping. Most guys will, a lot of players will roll their bottom lip over their teeth and 
only the top lip vibrates when they do that. And I've, I've done that with, with uh, experiments. We drilled a hole in a mouthpiece, put a fiber optic camera in there, and uh, only the top lip was moving. It was not at okay, but it wasn't great. And then I, I pulled my, chop, my chops up about maybe a millimeter, just a little bit. Tremendous difference in tone. And, by, and then when we looked at it on, in slow motion on the screen, whoop, both chops are moving. It was kind of like an, I was like an oboe player that only had one reed going. And I, a lot of players will do that. And so I'll say, let's bring that lower lip out, set a little higher. Roger Ingram talks about that in his book. You know, just Einsetzen, you know, the parallel with Einsetzen, setting in a little bit, getting the meat out of the mouthpiece, having an aperture. So whether you're playing high velocity music or the Haydn trumpet concerto, all the same thing. You want as much color and function as you can possibly get. So that, and then the other thing with the tonguing, the tonguing is the, is the, um, it's the biggest variable in mouth shape. So how you articulate controls the shape and it's, it's one of the major factors. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm big on tr tonguing as it affects uh, tone. So getting the chops fairly even, get the teeth close as you can. And you, and what do we can do to get that, that spark, that sound that, you know, where the horn comes alive, and then we can say, then we have some, then we have something to talk about. We have common ground. It's go for that feel, go for that tone, whatever. And the yeah, and the student can run with it, you know. Then they can say they have an idea, you know. I, I like that you mention in the book, you know, how how people dread an embouchure change, um, yeah. but it's making these fine adjustments. It's not a big change, and they make Absolutely. a big difference. And this is something that I've personally experienced, you know. Yeah, I'm doing it all the time. I get, I call them tweaks. If I have to pick off a really high note, super soft, I'll just go burp, a little bit. Burp. It's a little tweak. It's not a, you know, and we just have so many nerve endings. You, you know, and I think I have a, I put a thing in the book where I, where I drew a line on my face to show how, how small the adjustment was, uh, but just infinitesimal. But we have so many nerve endings in our, in our mouth. It feels like a big deal. It's not, you know, you, mm -hmm. everything we play is, you know, whether you're, Alan Vizzuti or Bud Herseth or Maurice Andre, it's a little thing about an inch wide with a hole. It's like three millimeters, right? <laughs> tiny, tiny changes can have enormous, you know, uh, uh, results. I and also that's, like, and that's a good thing. I also like that you said that um, I isolate the time of, of your practice, you know, for the, if you're going to make a change or an adjustment, don't do it within your regular practice session. No. <laughs> or if you're a busy dedicate... trumpeter, don't let it goof you up. Yeah, exactly. And I love that. You know, so th that's something that uh, I think a lot of, uh, you know, professionals and students al alike would, would go, oh, my God, I, I, I can't make a change. Or I'm working. Exactly. Or I'm in college or I've got this recital or whatever I've got in, in life. You know, I can't make a change now. <clears throat> Maybe I'll do it next year. Meanwhile, they're dysfunctional for the next year until... Right. Well, I can't and do risking, it this year either. <laughs> and risking injury too, you know. <clears throat> so I, I had to quit playing for a while because my chops were cut up and my teeth were loose, you know. So I, you know, I paid a high price, you know, when I was a young player. But yeah, treat the treat it like a second language where you become fluent in this and fluent in that, and you know, and you just practice it over here. You practice your Danish or your, you know, Mandarin, and you don't forget how to speak English, you know. And so you do your job, but you practice this over here. It's like a hobby. It's like a little game. And gradually you become fluent, you know, or or just you get good at both and it becomes assimilated a little bit. But That's yes, a great yeah, point. I, I love that. I love it too. Peter Bond, this has been fantastic talking to you, everybody. And Thank you. The new book is out. It's called The Singing Trumpet by Peter Bond, published by Carl Fisher. We hope you guys will check it out. We'll put a link down below so you guys can check it out and purchase it. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for being here and for thank your you. time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Feel free to chime in on some of the posts and I'm sure there'll be some uh, some uh, action there under under this video and uh, we, we welcome it. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, take care, guys. Stay cool. It's hot out there in the West Coast. Oh, gosh, it was 112 here, 110 yesterday. It was a scorcher, yeah, I, so we'll stay warm right. <laughs> or stay cool, yeah. I mean. I'm staying cool here in the South. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, cool. thanks again. Beautiful. Thank Take you. Care, guys. Thanks again.